Michelle here, welcome back to Arena. What's interesting about this segment of the game is that we're going to be visiting some areas that are the most familiar to Elder Scrolls fans, but in versions that are absolutely unrecognizable. Muriel is about to travel across the entire province of Skyrim. She'll spend about 19 days starting out near Falkreath and then gradually making her way toward Winterhold, the very frozen north of Tamriel. Now, whether you're coming out Arena as a player of Skyrim or a player of ESO, either way, we're centuries away from that timeline and lore, and a couple decades away in game technology, so this is a very different Skyrim. Now imagine with me for a moment what it's like for Muriel coming to Tamriel's coldest city in the month of Sun's Dawn, which corresponds to February. The way the city is laid out makes it excruciating to try to travel through. There are very few clear, wide avenues. The buildings are shaped irregularly and overlap in strange ways, and sometimes the entrances are so sheltered that you have to walk three times the width of the building just to find them, which makes sense if you're trying to protect people inside from the cold, but if you're new to the city trying to find shelter, it's a nightmare. But on the other hand, this is about to be an interesting turning point in Muriel's story because she's about to get the chance to really start to make a name for herself with the Mages Guild. Assuming, of course, that she can find the place before she freezes to death. Muriel wanders around lost in the snowy night for so long that the sun actually comes up and people start coming back out into the street so she can ask them for directions. about what omnipresent means. Anyway, we're about to meet Thelen Karn, who is the first Mages Guild NPC who gets an actual name. And he's got a bit of a personality as well. He's a very kind old gent who seems to need Muriel's help. This turns out to be the same drill as before. There's a bit of missing information that's been stolen and must be recovered before he can tell her how to get to Labyrinthian. And of course she will agree to help him, especially since he is asked so nicely. Now this fortress of ice that she's going to, Muriel recalls that Rhea said that was where this famous archmage Shalador once lived. But right now she has other concerns. The weather has somehow managed to get even worse, and she still hasn't slept. So guess what? She's got to wander all around the city in an icy fog with even less visibility than at night and try to find somewhere to lay her weary head. The maddening thing about the inns in Winterhold is that they're all sort of clustered together in the very center of the city. There isn't a single one that's anywhere near the city gates or anywhere near the Mages Guild or anywhere near anywhere else that Muriel might want to go. But assuming that Muriel ever manages to find her way into an inn and get some sleep, her next destination is 
the famous ice fortress of Winterhold, where during the first era, Shalador, the great archmage, lived with his wife uh, before she left him for neglecting her. So when Muriel returns to the Mage's Guild after resting up at the inn, she is surprised to find that Felon Karn believes her to have already attempted to infiltrate the Fortress of Ice and simply failed. What's even more surprising is that he expresses no disappointment, he doesn't scold her. In fact, he encourages her to use what she learned to try again. Not only that, but he actually pats her on the shoulder. And let's just keep in mind that it was four months ago that Muriel spent the night with a certain blue-haired stranger, and since then, not a single human being has touched her other than to try and murder her. So at this point, she would die for Thelen Karn, and um, even if she didn't need to find Labyrinthian, she would be going into that fortress of ice to get this tablet for him. I regret to inform you that the Fortress of Ice is very boring. This is one of the few quest dungeons in Arena that does not have a single word of description. And it is also fairly colorless on the whole. And I think that's a shame, given that we know it actually does have a very interesting history as the former home of one of the most famous people in Elder Scrolls history. The main noteworthy things that I can talk about from my experience in the Fortress of Ice are that I perfected a technique of using my magic sponge spell, thanks to these lovely little snow wolves that accommodated me nicely by breathing globes of frost magic at me. Uh, and I could basically use them as magic batteries, and it reduced a lot of the amount of time that I needed to spend resting, because as long as Muriel has magic points, she can heal herself, she can hurt other people, she can do everything she needs to do. Now here we also have these knights, the ones that um, supposedly stole this tablet from the Mage's Guild. I don't know what's up with their pointy little hands, but a couple of face punches brings them down nicely. We also encounter for the first time ice golems. Golems in general are very resistant to magic but a few cleverly applied fire darts and you can take one down. I do like the fact that if you manage to kill an ice golem it just melts into a puddle. Which is of course not lootable but what would you expect from a puddle? She also now has an open spell that she can use on any of the chests that appear in these dungeons. So she no longer has to miss out on any loot. I have seen zombies before, but I think this is the first time that I'm showing you one in the video. Face Punch brings them down nicely too. And then we have a troll. I love that the basic silhouette of Elder Scrolls trolls has been the same from the very beginning. They also have perhaps the most distressing sound effect of any animal in this game. We're level 11 now. And I'm mostly working on getting everything up to at least 50 at this point. So we're going to put some points into strength.
I did a lot of unnecessary exploring just in the hopes of finding something interesting I could share with you. I found nothing. I mean, I could have just gone straight to the second level, it's so near the entrance. But instead, I spent a lot of time wandering around, uncovering new areas like this corridor of death. Every single one of those rooms had a knight in it that tried to kill me and did not replenish my magic points. I kind of like this long canal that I found, it, it kind of in the center of the map, and it leads to this little island where there's this runestone looking thing. It doesn't do anything at all, but it was just kind of cool looking. Now the second level is a little less visually boring. It's not just solid blocks of ice, there's some embellishment on the walls. More wolves and stuff which I can one-shot with fire darts. But as you can see, it gets a little fancier down here. Some cool Nordic rune looking things. This floor must have been where Shalador and his lovely wife actually lived. And I'm sure it's just as chilly as their marriage. There's an interesting chamber that I found uh, in the Northeast that has hellhounds in it. They're absolutely not necessary to kill for any reason. Uh, their cage is locked. And the only benefit to unlocking it is that you get to kill a couple of hellhounds. Muriel gets to use them as magic batteries as well. Um, and then there's a little bit of treasure in the cell too. But this is a completely optional encounter. I do like the sudden splash of color after all of this white and silver and gray that I've been trudging through all this time. Now in the northwest area of the map, you finally find a blue door. And when I first approached this, the first thing I saw was that it was a magically held lock. So I thought, okay, well, open spell. And it worked. But then a riddle. I touch your face, I'm in your words, I'm lack of space and beloved of birds, what am I? Well, air, of course. And then that was what was supposed to open the door. But apparently an open spell works just as well. And an ice golem is in here, guarding the tablet that Thelen Karn wants, as well as a couple of piles of treasure, if you're into that kind of thing. Yeah, and that's pretty much it. That is all there is of any interest in the Fortress of Ice, which I spent hours exploring so you don't have to. Now Muriel has the happy task of delivering the news and the tablet to the wonderful Thelen Karn, who in my headcanon has become, in a paternal protective sort of way, rather fond of this persistent and spunky young redhead. And he might be a bit worried about the length of her absence. It's been about two weeks since the last time he saw her. So now she knows where Labyrinthian is. But let's keep in mind, she is also now freaking rich from all the treasure that she carted back from the Ice Fortress. So she's going to sell it all and then head back to Felon Karn to learn some new spells. We're going to get Pass Wall, which becomes super important. A light spell will make dungeons far less creepy. And also our first shock spell, which can also paralyze. Levitate's fun if you need to get across lava or something. And in case we run into any ghouls, how about a 100% chance to cure disease? Why not? I call that one Pocket Priest. 
And we still got money to burn, so why not cure poison and curses with one spell? Sure. Now, of course, in my head canon, she didn't just buy all these spells. She paid Felon Karn to personally train her and probably gave him heart eyes the whole time. She's so lonely on this quest of hers, with only a dead woman for company. Single player games are rough. So let's talk about Labyrinthian. I think Muriel's fingers were a little numb when she made this painting of it. Anyway, Labyrinthian appears in three different Elder Scrolls games, and as a result it has a conflicting layered mess of lore surrounding it. Originally it was a great capital city called Bromunar, which I spent like an hour on YouTube trying to figure out how to pronounce to no avail. Uh, it was built by the dragon cults in the Morefic era, and some undead dragon priest was bound down in the depths there. And then in the first era, Shalador decided to build a maze there, either to protect something called Glamoril, which means the secret of life, or to test potential archmages, or maybe both. But eventually the maze was abandoned completely. After it was abandoned, two brothers named Mogris and Conan went down there searching for Glamorel despite being warned not to, and they were never heard from again. And then someone tried to free the undead dragon priest from Bromunar about 700 years ago, but that failed, and I guess the place was forgotten again. And that brings us to the present day, when Jagar Tharn apparently rediscovers the labyrinth and uses it to hide a piece of the Staff of Chaos. Got it? Got it. And now for some bad poetry. This is the tale of two brothers who sought the secret of life. They ventured into this labyrinthian, weary from war and strife. The first was Conan the Elder, a strong and cunning man. He quested for riches and jewels, yet found fate had other plans. The second was Mogris the Dim, and few knew what he was worth. They saw only the lumbering giant, not the child who was blessed at birth. The few they told of their plans begged them to desist at their feet, but the brothers would test this puzzle of the North, for till then they had known no defeat. This is the tale of two brothers who failed the secret of life, forever held by two riddles which lead to the prize, and a wit as cunning and sharp as a knife. Did Shalador somehow write this poetry from beyond the grave? and? pay himself a little compliment there. I'm not entirely sure who is speaking. I have a lot of questions about Labyrinthian, actually. I mean, was part of the magic of the Labyrinth that it could automatically generate poetry about whatever was contained in it? That would certainly explain the quality of the poetry. Mogris the Dim, though he's a boar, holds the only key that unlocks this door. To find the riddle, you must first find the sun. Start your fateful search behind door number one. The doors are actually helpfully numbered. When you first walk in, there's those three grates in a row, and the one on the right side is um, labeled number one, leading to the realm of Mogris. That's one thing that is actually consistent between um, this version of Labyrinthian and another that you see. They're both divided into two halves. Another of my questions is simply, why did Shalador decide to build this elaborate maze, this testing ground for archmages and or protector of the secret of life, on top of the bound remains of an undead dragon priest. So this is an iron golem, and when I first saw it I panicked because I knew that they tend to be magic resistant. But then I threw a face punch at it and it just immediately fell apart not too scary. These can also be annoying for mages. These are ghosts, and this little thing it's casting can drain your magic points. Unless you have a magic sponge type spell, in which case 
it gives you magic back. Take that, ghost. And then you can see here these little subterranean tunnels that you do have to navigate a little bit if you want to find your way around this half of the labyrinth. And navigate a lot for the other half, but we will get there in a moment. Ooh, some creepy red eyes over in the corner. I'm sure that's fine. So I have actually found our way to Mogris, who is trapped in one of these cells. The one next to it has a key inside, but I can't get to it without dealing with Mogris, or what's left of him. I am Brother Mogris, the shade of this hall, cursed to its lengths from beginning to end. Find me the answer, and a door I will call. Fail me but once, and your heart I will rend. I'm told it's actually a pretty tough fight if uh, you end up having to fight him. More beautiful than the face of your god, yet more wicked than a demon's forked tongue. Dead men eat it all the time. Live men who eat it die slow. What is the answer, mortal? Nothing, obviously. I have been a fool, perhaps a mad wizard's tool, yet after untold ages I am at last free. In the cell next to this lies your reward, the diamond key. Just no grasp of, of meter and scansion whatsoever. Anywho, you can take the key back upstairs. The diamond key opens that first door. And then there's kind of a series of nested doors here that you have to find your way through. Khan and the Wise holds more to be seen, a key and a riddle and a test in between. To get past this portal, a feat done by few, search for the brother behind door number two. See how they're nested there, and we have to get through all three of them to get our staff piece. Door number two, helpfully labeled for us. I mean, as hard as they want to make this, why bother labeling the doors? I, I, I don't know. We are now in the realm of Conan. Little free range hellhounds down here. And as you can see, absolutely riddled, pun absolutely intended, with subterranean tunnels and shafts that you have to navigate your way through in order to find once again the two cells, one with a key and one with a brother. Conan's a little shy. You can't see him. And he gives you this riddle, two bodies have I, though both joined in one, the more still I stand, the quicker I run. Um, that's a classic. So if you don't know that's an hourglass, I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm free to fly the wind after an eternity of sickness and sin. As a reward for setting me free, the cell next to this holds your sapphire key. Okay, whatever. Was it the brothers themselves who composed this poetry? Did they just have nothing better to do while they were locked down here for literally ages? Another big question. What is Glamoril, the secret of life? All I know for sure about it is that in order to complete it, Shalador made a deal with Sheagorath, the Daedric Prince of Madness. Sheagorath had a book that Shalador was sure he needed to finally create or understand Glamoril, and so Shalador traded him an island for it. Let me pause for a moment to admit that this riddle stumped me briefly. Uh, what force and strength cannot get through, I with a gentle touch can do, and many in these twisted halls would stand, were I not as a friend at hand. I thought that could be air, that could be water, that could be any number of things that people would die without down here, and that could also get into things that you can't break down by force. And then I looked at the last two lines again, and I realized it doesn't say they'll die without it, it just said that they'll stand down here, unable to move forward. And then it occurred to me that the other two doors needed a key to get through, and this one didn't seem to require one, 
except that it did. That key is the answer, and I thought that was a little bit clever, actually. Anyhow, here's the thing about Glamoril. It obviously isn't an object that only one person can possess, because we know that some would-be arch archmages did pass Shalador's tests, and that Glamoril remained here for them to find, so it must be something abstract. But at the same time, it must be protected by a labyrinth, and that means that it could be gained or understood if it were simply left lying around. Now, Jagar Tharn has been to the center of the maze to leave the staff piece here. Does he now know it? Muriel has now made it to the center of the maze. Once she defeats this ghost and gets in there, will she know it? And if so, how will that change her? It's believed to be the reason for Shalador's vast magical knowledge, his endless writings on magical theory. He, he was like the Alexander Hamilton of thaumaturgy. So when Muriel emerges from this labyrinth, I don't think she's the same woman who went in. For the purposes of this story, I'm assuming that whatever Glamoril is, it's more of a seed that's been planted in her mind at this point, and it will slowly begin to bear fruit over the course of the story. We're also going to talk a little bit more later about Sheagorath, but for now let's return to the practical considerations of Muriel's little quest. This is what they're calling the Emperor's Suite in Muriel's Chosen Tavern, and here she'll have another helpful little dream. I would congratulate you on retrieving the second piece of the Staff of Chaos, but dire portents have I seen. The third piece of the Staff lies somewhere in the Elden Grove, ancient home of the Elves. The Elden Grove is said to be the birthplace of the Sacred First Tree, that which gave life to all the forests on the continent of Tamriel. Its location has been a closely guarded secret, so guarded in fact that many believe that even the elves have forgotten its true location. Considering that there are only three provinces that hold any of the elven people, your search should not be too difficult. <laughs> three provinces, yeah, that's easy. So easy, maybe you should do it. I wish you well on your quest. Luckily, the very first person that Muriel asks happens to have heard some rumors about Elden Grove. And that's a good thing, given that the three different homelands of the elves are scattered all over the map. Valenwood is going to be a bit of a trek. She's going to have to cross the Imperial Province to get there. Looking at her map, uh, gosh, it seems like a place called Elden Root might be a good place to start if looking for Elden Grove, just, just a hunch. So that's where she's headed, and it's going to be a long trip. <laughs> 